Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, once again we give you thanks for this day and for the many blessings of our lives. We know that all good things in our lives come from above. We thank you for this time we have together, to be drawn together in the Spirit in this time of worship. Lord, we ask that you strengthen every person that is here this day, that as we leave this place, we may indeed live our lives as an act of worship in the week to come. We thank you for the Holy Scripture from which we have read and heard this day, and we ask that you open our hearts to receive your truth found in your Scripture. And in the moments to come, may the words which are spoken and the meditations and thoughts in each and every heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some years ago, a physician named George Hawkins shared in an article a colleague's of his experience. It seems that a man came to his colleague's office with a severe rash, and it prompted the man from this rural area to come to town and to be examined by the doctor. And after the usual history taking, followed by a series of tests, the physician advised the patient that what he was suffering from was an allergy, and it was an allergy to his bird dog. And um, he was going to have to get rid of his bird dog. And so the man was preparing to leave the office, and the doctor asked him out of curiosity, are you going to sell your bird dog or give him away? And the man said, neither. He said, I'm going to go get a second opinion. And then he added these words, it's a lot easier to find another doctor than to get a good bird dog. Well, unfortunately, sometimes a second opinion doesn't change the diagnosis. One of the most difficult experiences in life is to receive a bad diagnosis, particularly if that diagnosis is of a life-threatening nature. And when a person receives a Diagnosis like that, the person oftentimes will begin to ask, what can I do? What can I do? And we're willing to change our eating habits, our exercise regimens, whatever it takes. If there's anything I can do, tell me. But sometimes there is nothing that a person can do to help themselves, to save themselves. And sometimes the only thing that can save a person is the treatment that's offered by the physician. The person can do nothing in and of themselves to receive the prescribed treatment. The Bible teaches us that we as human beings have to receive a condition. A condition that cannot be worked out all on our own. But the good news is that God has offered as a free gift the healing of that situation. Now today we heard three passages of Scripture. One from Genesis, the story of the fall. And then we heard a portion of Paul's letter to the Romans, which the letter of the Romans, if if Paul ever had a doctoral dissertation, it was the book of Romans. It's a brilliant book on salvation. And then we hear from the Gospel of Matthew about Jesus' on time of temptation in the wilderness. And each one of these passages are very key passages in the whole of the Bible. And today, we read them together. And I just want to briefly touch on each of them and highlight for you what Paul is trying to tell us and what the Bible tells us throughout. And that is, we have a condition that we cannot heal, but God has offered to us a free gift of that healing. 
In today's passage from Genesis, we hear that familiar story of the fall of humanity. Humanity chose to disobey God and pursue its own path, heeding the words of the serpent rather than the command of God Almighty. And since the fall, humanity's relationship with our Creator is broken, and we can do nothing in and of ourselves to fix that. Now in the story, prior to the woman's creation in the story, God is talking to the man. And he gives the man the freedom to choose anything in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From that tree you shall not eat or you will die. And then in chapter 3 of Genesis, we have the scene. The scene opens with the woman and the serpent having a conversation. And evidently, the woman is standing and looking at the tree that God had commanded for them not to eat. Now some have wondered, why might God offer that choice in the first place? If God created this perfection, why did God create something that, if chosen, would ruin the creation? But remember that the Bible also teaches us that God is love, and that he created humanity in his image. And love requires freedom. Love only exists when freely chosen and freely given. So the scene opens with the woman talking with the serpent. And there they are by the tree. And she seems to be looking at that tree. You know, one's eyes often will focus on one's heart's desire. And the serpent comes and asks, did God really say that you shall not eat from any of the trees, twisting God's words. No, said the woman. We can't eat of this tree, nor shall we touch it, adding to God's word. Nor shall we touch it, or else we'll die. The serpent said, you won't die lying. Do you see how it happened? God's word gets twisted, and then it gets added to, and then it's just outright lied about, and ultimately disobedience and death occurs. Remember now, God originally gave that command to the man. And the only way that the woman would have known of that command was that the man had to tell her. So it's a good question to ask of where was the man while this conversation was going on? And we know the answer from the scripture. The man was right there all the time. Because it says that when she saw, when she saw that the fruit looked good to eat, she took of it and she ate it, and it says she gave it to the man who was with her. So the whole time, the man's standing right there. He was there the whole time, silent. Silent while God's word was twisted. Silent while God's word was added to. And silent when God's word was actually lied about. Silence in the midst of all of this disobedience. And his own silence was just as disobedient as their act. And that disobedience, brought sin and death into the world. Now, when they took and disobeyed and they ate of the fruit and they disobeyed God's word, they immediately recognized their nakedness and their shame and they began to try to cover themselves very poorly with some leaves that they tried to stitch together 
And as the story continues beyond where we read today, God ends up coming and finding them in the garden, and ultimately he provides clothing of skins for them. The early church pointed out that God's provision of animal skins to cover their shame required the shedding of blood and life, which was a glimpse of what Christ was ultimately going to do for the sake of all humanity. It took God's efforts to cover them because their own efforts couldn't do it. And ultimately, it was going to take God to reconcile humanity and offer salvation by Christ's death upon the cross. God had given to humanity the gift of freedom. And humanity took that gift and freely chose to go their own way. In the passage from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is led by the Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness. Like the Allies uh, arriving at Normandy Beach in World War II to begin Europe's liberation, so Christ entered the wilderness to begin the liberation of humanity. And just prior to going into the wilderness, Jesus had been baptized. And at his baptism, God had said, This is my beloved Son, with him I am well pleased. And after Jesus had fasted for 40 days, the tempter began the temptation by testing and assailing God's word that Jesus had heard at his own baptism. The tempter began, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And of course, if Jesus had answered that temptation, it would have meant he was doubting what God had said. Jesus, instead, he answered by quoting Scripture. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he avoided the temptation to use any power to serve himself. The devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point on the temple. And knowing that Jesus was going to rely on Scripture, he took a text from the, from the Scriptures that was seen to be a prophecy of the Messiah, and he took it out of context, and he says, why don't you jump down from the temple here in front of everybody? Why don't you jump? Because it's written the, that the angels will take charge of you and, and keep you from even hitting your foot upon a stone. Jesus didn't argue. He didn't enter into a debate. He didn't point out the obvious trick that the devil was using. He simply relied on what he knew to be God's word. He relied on scripture again. He said, said, you shall not test the Lord your God. And he avoided the temptation to, to draw a bunch of attention to himself. And then the devil took Jesus to a tall mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world. Now remember back in Genesis, how it it appears that Eve, the woman, was looking at that tree, and that the tempter spoke to her while she was looking. But notice here in Matthew, it said that he took Jesus and showed Jesus the kingdoms. Jesus wasn't sitting around looking and desiring. The devil showed him. And the devil said, all of this, all of this, I will give you. You just do one thing. You just bow down and worship me and I'll give all of this to you. Of course, this was a lie. And it's always a lie. Because the Psalms say, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And notice that Jesus responded immediately to the lie. Immediately and decisively, which is far different than the silence that Adam had. And again, Jesus relied and used the word of God 
Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Him alone. Jesus avoided the temptation to be a typical king, relying on power and force to try to gain the world. Instead, Jesus used his freedom for perfect obedience to God's word. Paul, in the book of Romans, tries to explain the salvation of Christ to the Jewish believers in Rome. And part of what Paul tries to argue with those believers is that the law of Moses could never save us And in today's passage, what he gets to is the point of saying, think about this. Sin was in the world before the law. Right? And he says, consider that death came into the world and sin came into the world with Adam. With one person, sin and death came into the world, beating the disobedience of Adam. The diagnosis of humanity is that we are in a condition of sin and death, and it's there because of Adam, Paul is saying. And Paul writes, it reigns in each of us, and the evidence is we all sin. And the diagnosis is very serious. Our condition concerns the welfare of our very being. The same sin of Adam is in each one of us. We all have used the gift of freedom to choose our own way. And the difficult news to hear is that there is nothing that you or I can do to correct it. Nothing on our own that we can do to correct it. But as followers of Jesus, we know there is hope. And Paul shows us that God has provided a solution in Jesus Christ the solution to our misuse of our free will is God's offer in Christ of a free gift. Five times in the passage from Romans we heard, in a two and a half verse, in two and a half verses of the passage we heard, five times Paul uses those words, free gift, free gift, free gift, free gift, free gift. He doesn't want that to go unnoticed. That the free gift is nothing that we did anything about. Paul tells us that the sin of one man brought death and condemnation, but the free gift brings justification and an abundance of grace and righteousness. If the sin of one person can bring all of the sin and death that we know, how much more can the the, the act of one person, Jesus Christ, bring the justification and grace? The free gift was nothing that we accomplished on our own, but it is dependent altogether on God's grace. God is holy and God is love, and the holiness of God had to deal with sin, and the love of God couldn't help but save us. And then Paul explains, as by one man's disobedience, the people were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, we are made righteous. Now some people say, and maybe you've heard it said, something along these lines that doctrine really doesn't matter. Maybe you've heard that said, doctrine... I don't know if I need a bunch of doctrine. Doctrine really doesn't matter. In the end, what matters is that you live a good life. Have you ever heard that said? But that statement in and of itself is a doctrine. It's called the doctrine of salvation by works rather than by grace. It's something that's heretical to the teaching of the church and to Scripture. It is to say, no thank you to God's free gift. 
If you believe that your works and your good life can earn God's grace, then you negate Christ's overcoming of temptation, his perfect obedience to God's word, and his atoning death upon the cross. For salvation is not about our works. Because, friends, when humanity tries to go its own way, it really messes things up. It's all about the free gift of God's grace. It's about the work of Christ to reconcile humanity to God. Being reconciled to God is not dependent upon us. It's found in that God has come to be with us in Jesus Christ. It's found in that grace of God that was always reaching out. As I touched on earlier in the story about the garden, it's God who comes to the garden and seeks out the man and the woman. In Psalm 23, what are the words? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Indeed, in Hebrew, that word follow is actually more, more closely translated pursue. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God being like a shepherd who went out looking for the sheep that was lost. Indeed, it's not about what you and I do, but it's about the grace of God. Thanks be to God. Christ has done the work. In Adam, death and sin enter the world. In Christ, justification and righteousness are offered to all that would accept it. A free gift. Today we take communion. And all are invited who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to come and partake of communion. And it's a gift to us from Christ. That when we take it, we remember his perfect obedience. We remember that he was perfectly obedient even to death upon a cross. And that he offered his body and his blood for the sake of all humankind. Body and blood who's sacrificed, who sacrificed clothes and righteousness a humanity that had used its free will to disobey. But those who accept the free gift receives that clothing and righteousness. As you come today and partake, remember, remember what Christ has done. Remember what Christ has done that you and I cannot accomplish on our own, nor do we have to ever worry about it, because it's done completely and fully. It is for us to simply accept. And so this day, in your heart, Won't you accept the free gift? The free gift offered by God to all that would accept. Let it be so for all of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.